looking to see when this is going to start. Here we go. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our March meeting of the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. Oop. Hold on. I don't know if we're all the way live yet. I think we are. This meeting right. is now streaming live on Facebook. Cool. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first meeting of 2022. My name is Stephen. I'm the current president of the club. Uh, this is our first meeting of the year and really excited to give you all some updates on the club, tell you what we've got planned for the year. Um, yeah, so first up, everyone should have received their copy of the March April newsletter, either in the mail or in your email inbox. Um, a lot of good articles in here about all of our events this year, which I'll be giving you some updates on as we go through the slides. So first up, we'll be resuming in-person meetings in May, and we're planning to meet at the Frick Environmental Center. So it's a new location, um, but I'm really excited to, to bring the club there and to kick things off with our cultivation meeting in May. So it'll probably be mostly outside, um, fingers crossed for good weather. So that's some exciting news. Um, that's the only big update for like things that are totally new with the club this year. So um, since our last meeting, there has been a walk. Uh, it took place in November at Hartwood Acres. John Plischke and I think Barbara Batakova were there. And um, yeah, they found a lot of cool stuff. There's pictures in a species list up on our website, I believe, if you want to know more about what folks found. In terms of upcoming walks, we've got a lot to announce. Um, we were originally planning to have a lichen walk at Hillman uh, this past weekend. But with the snowstorm, we decided to postpone it two weeks. Um, so we'll be meeting at Hillman on March 26th at 10 a.m. Um, and directions to the parking lot where we're meeting are on the website. Allegheny Land Trust has a lot of hikes coming up. Um, a lot of them are already sold out. So some important things to note about Allegheny Land Trust walks this year. Um, it is pre-registration only, so no walk-ins, and it is $5 per person. Um, so you can register at alleghenylandtrust.org slash events. Um, our secretary and identifier, Julie Trevellini, will be leading those walks. And on July 6th, Fluff Burger is going to be joining um, at Lindbrook Woodlands. And I'm sure Julie's in the chat. She can share uh, answers to any questions folks have. On April 17th, I'll be leading a walk in Frick Park. Um, this one is actually already sold out as well. I forgot to update this slide. Um, so yeah, Easter Sunday in Frick Park. Hopefully we'll find some spring mushrooms. Uh, about a week later at Peters Lake Park, there's a morel hike with John Plischke. Um, Pre-registration is required for this and it's an evening walk. So there's a link on our website that you can follow to register. I think you'll have to make a profile um, to register with the, the Peters Lake Park folks, um, but it is free. In terms of other upcoming events, uh, the City Nature Challenge is coming up at the end of April. If you're unfamiliar, this is a global virtual bio blitz. So you can make observations um, just like pictures and upload them to the iNaturalist app or on the website. And um, if you go out and find anything living and take pictures of it during this weekend, you can count that towards 
Pittsburgh stats in the City Nature Challenge. Um, if you don't live close to Pittsburgh, a lot of other cities around the region are participating, including Columbus, Cleveland, Rochester, Ithaca, Philly, Baltimore, DC. I know we have members um, from a lot further away than Western PA, so maybe your city is participating. Here's our meeting schedule for the year. So like I said, we'll be resuming in-person meetings in May. Um, yeah. <laughs> Other events that are coming up, we have Mushroom Education Day on Saturday, April 23rd. And yeah, morning classes. Uh, there's three classes that'll be happening in the morning. So Kara's gonna lead a talk on morels. Julie's gonna present on iNaturalist and the City Nature Challenge. And uh, Espo is gonna be giving a cultivation class um, that's gonna be really awesome. So we'll be meeting at this building, the Ohio Township Nature Center, which is out in Swickley. And there's an afternoon walk, which is free. So if you just wanna come for the walk, that's cool. Um, but the class has a registration fee. And Espo put together this really fun flyer for the event uh, and just posted it today. Um, so just thought I'd put it up here. It gives a little more detail. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, to register for this, just go to our website, wpamushroomclub.org slash events uh, and scroll down to April 23rd. And you can click through there and register for this. Um, folks will get to take home a uh, heresium uh, grow block, so like a lion's mane block, to grow their own mushrooms. So that'll be cool. I know Espo has a lot of really exciting things planned for this, uh, kind of some low-tech, DIY, low-cost uh, mushroom cultivation techniques. So should be pretty exciting. And then of course, there is the Linkoff foray. Um, we're really, really excited to be at the lodge this year. Um, I know it's always a, uh, a race to get this space booked. Thanks so much to folks who stay up until midnight to get in on the website and register to um, reserve the space for the foray. So yeah, we'll be at the lodge on Saturday, September 24th with our pre-foray walk in Cook Forest on the 23rd. And we've got some wonderful guests that we're excited to bring this year. Um, Arlene and Alan Bassett will be joining us, which is awesome. Alan is a distinguished emeritus professor of biology at uh, Utica College of Syracuse University. He's a professional mycologist and has authored or co-authored more than 25 books. At the foray, Alan is gonna be helping us with mushroom identification and we'll also give a table talk at the end of the day. Um, Arlene has authored or co-authored 18 books in total and she'll be giving a presentation on polypores. That was the subject of her most recent book, um, so really excited to be bringing her to speak on polypore fungi, and they will both be available um, for a meet and greet in the afternoon to sign any copies of their books that you would like to have autographed. Yay, we're so excited. And we'll also be bringing Stephen Russell. Um, so he will be our other guest mycologist. He is the author of The Essential Guide to Cultivating Mushrooms, which we sell at our sales table. And he's also the founder of the Hoosier Mushroom Society. He'll be presenting on the next generation of DNA research. So really, really excited to be bringing Stephen Russell to Western Pennsylvania. I know um, John and Garrett and a lot of folks from our club have been going out to Indiana and, and studying alongside Stephen for years. So it's exciting to be bringing them here. All right, here's our membership report. Uh, at the end of last year in total, we had a 
record shattering 1,445 members from 803 households. And so far this year, we're already up to 487 members from 255 households. Um, and this number is probably uh, out of date. We probably have passed this. A lot of people I think joined today just to be able to join us here live. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to everyone for being a member of the club, whether this is your first year or you've been a member from the start. Uh, we really appreciate your support. And um, yeah, the money that we gather from membership just supports all of the different efforts we have as a club, um, which includes our own DNA barcoding project, um, you know, running the Linkoff foray, um, running all the other events that we do. So thanks so much for supporting us. And if you're watching this recording and you're not already a member, here's some information on our um, dues and some of the benefits of becoming a member. Some other benefits that aren't listed here are that you'll receive our bi-monthly newsletter, you'll get updates on our walks and events, a discount on your registration fee for the Linkoff foray, and um, when you attend our in-person meeting in May, you'll get to take home a oyster mushroom grow kit. So those are just some of the perks. You also get to say you're in a really cool club, right? <laughs> ah, yes. So at this point, um, speaking of membership, uh, we wanted to put up for vote honorary membership for Dale Lutheringer. Um, the the club's board of directors received a nomination for honorary membership um, this past year. And uh, Dale is an environmental education specialist at Cook Forest State Park in Clarion County. Uh, almost every year since 2015, Dale has joined us for our pre foray walk at Cook Forest. And he always reserves facilities for us and waives fees. Um, so that we can have the ideal space and, and really have a good time when we're up at Cook Forest. Um, Dale also comes with us on the pre foray walk and teaches folks about the old growth forest. Um, and he keeps a species list of every mushroom that we've ever found in Cook Forest. So he keeps a running tab on that, um, really enjoys getting uh, our species list each year and going through it. And, seeing you know what new stuff we found that he can add to his life list of the mushrooms of cook forest um yeah so dale is just a really supportive um person and we'd like to honor him by giving him honorary membership but we need the whole group's approval so i'm going to launch a poll here and you should see this on your screen it says, do you approve honorary membership for Dale Lutheringer, environmental education specialist at Cook Forest State Park? Um, so you can vote yes or no. And once I see most folks have participated, I'll end the poll and show you the results. Okay, Stephen, I'm yep, how, I guess. how do I get to how do I get to vote? Do you uh, need to kick me out? Um well. You can just tell us your vote, Cecily, and I'll add it. So far, uh, we've had an overwhelming majority vote um, in one direction. So your vote is unlikely to change the result. OK. <laughs> All right, 96% of people have participated. I'm going to end the poll here. And here are the results. So we had 99% approval of honorary membership for Dale. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations, Dale. Welcome to the club for life. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, so we don't have any Mushroom ID Awards tonight, but I just wanted to put a plug in 
um, about this program that we have. So uh, we run a, a mushroom ID button program and it's to recognize club members who can identify different species of mushrooms. Um, we award buttons at all different kinds of levels. And um, yeah, all you have to do is put together a list of what species you know and submit it to the email on the screen here. And uh, our committee will review it and award you a button at one of our meetings. Mm -hmm. So if you're new or if you have only submitted your 50 or your 75, um, now's a good time to think about putting a list together and submitting it. I'd love to give some of these awards away at our next meeting. All right, so next month's meeting is really exciting. We're gonna be bringing in Dr. Matt Kaysen from uh, WVU, and he's gonna be talking about the fungal biodiversity and ecology of Appalachia. Um, so uh, Dr. Kaysen received his PhD in plant pathology from Penn State University where his research focused on using a native fungus as a biological control of the invasive tree, Elanthus altissima, which is the tree of heaven. Um, he also has degrees from Paul Smith College and the University of Maine. His current research areas include fungal arthropod interactions, biological control of invasive plants and pathogens, and the biology and ecology of historic and emerging diseases of forest trees. Dr. Kaysen is currently the interim director of International Culture Collection of Vesicular Arbuscular Mycorrhizal Fungi, and currently has research focused on the metabolites associated with interactions between arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and their plant partners. Dr. Kaysen teaches undergrad courses on general plant pathology and forest pest management, and offers special topics courses for graduate students at WVU. So we're really excited to be bringing him. And again, that'll be on Zoom. So yeah, any, any questions, any updates? I haven't been able to check the chat. Everything good? Cool. Well, uh, that leads us to the speaker portion of tonight's meeting, and I'll also be the speaker. So I hope you don't find my voice too annoying. <laughs> I'll be talking for a little bit now. And uh, yeah, tonight I'm going to be presenting on spring mushrooms. So give me a sec here to change over to my other slides. Oh no. <laughs> Gotta go to the beginning. Here we go. <laughs> cool. All right. So, yeah, tonight I'm going to be presenting a talk that I'm calling More Than Morels Spring Mushrooms of Western Pennsylvania. And uh, I'll get into that more in a little bit. Well, a little bit about me. Um, hi, I'm Steven. I'm currently the president of the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. I'm also an identifier for the club. I have a bachelor's degree in ecology from Penn State Erie. I took some plant pathology courses there where I got to do a little bit of study of fungi, but for the most part, my knowledge of Mycology is all stuff that I have learned on my own, um, just by doing research and attending different events, um, especially events hosted by this club. I've learned a lot from the people here. And uh, I also work as a naturalist at the Frick Environmental Center. And yeah, I really enjoy just sharing what I've learned and that's what I'm here to do tonight. So I'm gonna be talking about spring fungi, but before I get into that, um, I wanted to just 
present a little overview on fungi and mushrooms. Since this is our first meeting of the year, I thought, you know, there might be some new folks in the club who don't know a ton about fungi, but are curious and want to learn more. So I'm going to start with just like a brief, broad overview, and then we'll dive into our spring mushrooms. So what are fungi? Well, they're eukaryotic organisms, and they've got cell walls mostly made up of chitin, uh, which is a chemical you also find in insects. And they get their nutrients by excreting enzymes and acids into their surrounding environment and absorbing those nutrients. Um, so they're more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And um, this is just a picture of the tree of life, kind of showing where mushrooms fall in relation to animals and plants, which I think just looks really nice. Here's a cladogram, just kind of showing the relationships. Um, you probably learned the five kingdoms in school, and there's some debate about how many kingdoms scientists want to organize all of life into nowadays. Um, there's a proposed kingdom that puts uh, animals and fungi under the same title, which is the Epistocontes. Um, so yeah, we are very closely related to fungi. And uh, whether it's a kingdom or a queen queendom, uh, the fungi are a pretty diverse group. There's at least 120,000 species that have been described. And that is a small portion of the millions of species estimated to exist. The vast majority of these don't produce mushrooms. Um, and there are about 10,000 mushroom producing fungi in North America with at least 3,000 here in Pennsylvania. Most of the diversity of species falls within two main groups or phyla, which are the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota, but there's several other groups. Um, you've maybe heard of the chytrids, which are parasites of amphibians. Um, the glomeromycota are really important for agriculture. And there's another group that was formerly known as the zygomycota, which has recently been divided into two separate groups. And I'm going to be talking about one of them tonight. So yeah, that's a little bit about fungi in general. So like I said, the two main phyla are the ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes. Um, so the ascos are often these kind of cup-shaped mushrooms. And this is the largest phylum within uh, the entire group of fungi. Almost all lichens and endo endophytic fungi are ascomycetes. So endophytes are fungi that live within the living tissues of plants, in their leaves, in their stems. Um, all of the fungi that are used in the production of beer, bread, industrial enzymes, and a lot of fermented foods are also ascomycetes. Um, and it also includes the morels. Um, yeah. The basidiomycetes are a little less diverse, but it's still the second largest phylum in the fungi. And um, this is what people typically think of when they hear mushroom. Uh, most of the edible and medicinal mushrooms that exist are basidiomycetes. There are some outcasts in the group that form lichens, there's Basidiomycete yeasts, um, human pathogens, and some rust and other plant pathogens um, are also Basidiomycetes. So when we look at fungi, um, well, when we look at a mushroom, we're only looking at a part of the entire organism. Um, so we're looking at the reproductive structure, the spore bearing structure, and um, this is a very simplified diagram of a fungus life cycle, just kind of showing that the, the purpose of a mushroom is to create spores. The spores get spread um, throughout the environment, hopefully landing somewhere where they can grow, where they form hyphae that eventually form mycelium that eventually produce more mushrooms. 
Um, so in some fungi have a lot more complicated life cycles than this, but just a general life cycle. All right. Oop. Ah. Sorry, my computer froze up there for a sec. Now on to the main part of this presentation. Um, so I'm presenting on spring fungi of Western Pennsylvania, and I called it more than morels because I really wanted to highlight um, different kinds of mushrooms that aren't morels. I feel like when, when the temperatures start to get warmer, everyone's like, oh, morel season. It's going to be here any day now. Um, and I get it. Morels, you know, they're pretty amazing. They're pretty tasty. Um, but there's so many other spring mushrooms. So I wanted to just really try to spread um, some love to some of those other species. So this presentation is going to feature about a dozen of the hundreds of species that can be found in Western Pennsylvania in the spring. And I've organized it relatively in order of when they'll begin to appear. I'm going to share a little bit about how to identify them, um, their ecology, and some other interesting things about them. So I'll also share a teeny bit about edibility. Um, regarding edibility, I'm just going to say up front that I make no warranties about the safety of consuming these mushrooms. Um, some people experience gastric upset from species that are safely enjoyed by others, right? Um, we know this about chicken of the woods. Some folks have a sensitivity to that. Um, same is true for other species. Even morels, some people have a sensitivity to and experience gastric upset. Um, so that said, uh, the, I, the information I'm going to be sharing in this presentation is just a starting point in identifying these species. And other resources, such as trusted field guides, should be consulted before deciding to consume any mushroom. Um, so don't just watch some video online and go out and think you can pick something and eat it, right? Uh, go with someone who knows what they're doing or consult other resources. I think that's, I hope I made that clear. <laughs> All right, so first up, we have the Scarlet Elf Cup. And we actually have uh, two different species here that are almost identical. Um, so we have Sarcosypha austriaca and Sarcosypha dudleyi. I think I spelled dudleyi wrong here. I think it has a Y in it. Um, sorry about that typo. And uh, yeah, so this is a really beautiful mushroom. I mean, look at that bright red cup. Um, they can be pretty cup-shaped or bowl-shaped, or they can be kind of all over the place. Um, they get to be up to about three inches wide at the biggest. Um, generally, they're a little smaller than that. And yeah, so they've got this bright red upper surface, kind of fades in color as they age. And the, um, so the fertile surface, the spore bearing surface is on the inside of this cup, right? So the bright red areas are where the spores are produced. The outside of the cup is the infertile surface or the sterile surface. And um, it's slightly hairy. You can't really tell in this picture, but if you look up close with the hand lens, it'll have some hairs on it. And uh, this mushroom, you'll find it growing on woody debris, uh, especially like small to medium sized branches um, that are partially buried. So sometimes it'll appear terrestrial, but if you carefully dig it up, you'll find that it's attached to a stick. Um, sometimes you can find it growing on, on bigger, almost log sized um, pieces of wood, especially if they're like moss covered. But yeah, so that's a little bit about um, this mushroom. Oh, also it doesn't have a stem. There's a really similar looking species in the same genus, um, Sarcosypha occidentalis, that has a stem. And the, um, the sterile surface isn't fuzzy on that one. So just a little on its distribution, you can find this almost anywhere east of the Rockies. So this is just from iNaturalist. I made one of these for every species. So I just think it's interesting to show 
what the geographic distribution of these species are. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, there's a almost identical species that grows along the west coast. I think that's Sarcosypha coccinea. Um, yeah, Sarcosypha austriaca, the name for that, that means from Austria. And yeah, you can find it in Austria and all across Europe. So this is a really interesting example of a species where uh, the European variety and our local one are the same species. Um, so sometimes there's mushrooms in Europe that look identical to the ones that grow here, but um, we're able to determine that they're not the same species as we study their spores or, or barcode them. Um, but this one is the same. So yeah, but um, I think Sarcosypha dudleyi is only found in Eastern North America. So in terms of when to find this mushroom, uh, I found it nine days ago in Southwestern PA. So that, that first picture I showed you, I took this year. Um, so this mushroom is out already in our area and will be continuing to fruit um, through April. So this is definitely one of the first spring mushrooms. Uh, it's a really fun one to go out and look for. And uh, yeah, here's another photo from Kara, just to show when it's a little younger, it's a little more compact and closed up. And uh, yeah, this is technically an edible species. Um, various sources give it a <laughs> lackluster edibility score of non-poisonous, right? You love seeing that in a field guide. Ed edibility, non-poisonous very descriptive. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, there's a, a gentleman, Alden Dirks, who runs a blog called 1001 Edible Mushrooms. And he cooked and tried Sarcosypha dudleyi and um, said it was pretty good. But uh, there aren't a lot of records about people eating this mushroom. So you would definitely be uh, con contributing to science if you wanted to cook some of this mushroom and try it and see if you have a reaction to it. Um, so far, there doesn't seem to be evidence of any toxic chemicals in it, but I have not researched it thoroughly to know if there's any such risk. Um, so yeah, some people eat this. I don't know if anyone else has tried it, leave your comments in the chat. I think the main thing preventing people from eating this is you don't ever really find a lot of it at once. Usually you find maybe one or two fruitings if you're lucky. So, yeah. All right, next up we've got the devil's urn. This is another cup fungus. So yeah, it's in the Ascomycota, uh, but this is in a different family than the Scarlet Elf Cup. Uh, so this is in the, the genus Ernula, this is the type species for that genus. Um, it just means little urn. And the species epithet criterium um, is a reference to an ancient um, type of bowl that they used in Greece to mix wine with water. I didn't know that until I was like, what does this word mean? So I guess this looks like a bowl that they used in ancient Greece. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty cool mushroom that you can find also growing on um, usually decaying wood, like small to medium branches that are partially buried. That's where I've always found this. Um, identifying characteristics include its overall kind of dark brown to blackish color. Uh, it's more black on the inside. Uh, I've got a couple more pictures I'll show you here. And um, the general shape of it is pretty distinctive too. It's more urn shaped when young and it expands to more of a goblet or cup in age. The inner sur surface is smooth and the outer surface is often really cracked and scaly. So you can see here uh, this kind of warty or scaly appearance. This is another one that's um, only found east of the Rockies in North America. 
It's also found in boreal forests across Europe and parts of Asia, but it's much less common on those continents. Um, so Eastern North America is really the best place to encounter this species. It's where you're most likely, likely to see it. Uh, this is another one that should be fruiting about now. Um, it follows the Scarlet Elf Cup pretty closely in terms of fruiting time. Another thing I wanted to say about these graphs, uh, I made these on iNaturalist and I filtered it so that it was only using observations from Pennsylvania. So these, these fruiting charts, the like timing that I'm showing, uh, this is specifically when they are found in Pennsylvania. Um, I found that that was a little more accurate than the entire US, um, which kind of broadens the, the range when you can find these mushrooms. Um, that said, some of these species are a little more rare, and so we're missing data points, and some of these graphs might not fully reflect um, all the possible times when you can find these species. Anyhow, I did a little digging on Ernula and found this really awesome paper that was in a 1958 issue of Mycologia. Um, look at this illustration. So this is kind of what this mushroom looks like as it's developing. Um, so we've got kind of a side view here, a top view at the very top, and a cross-section view. And you can see as it um, grows, it expands and opens up into that more cup-shaped form. So this is what it looks like once it's a little more mature. You can really see that dark black interior. It's really opened up into more of a goblet. Um, yeah. And the cool thing about both of these cup mushrooms is that you can get them to release their spores. And sometimes you can visually watch them release their spores. So this is a slow motion video I made. And if you watch, there it goes. You can see a cloud of spores being released from this one on the right. You can still see some spores kind of twinkling there. If you have a, a big enough monitor, hopefully that's coming through. Um, yeah, so a cool thing about these cup fungi is uh, they're really sensitive to different stimuli in their environment. So if you simulate a breeze by blowing on them, uh, it'll trigger them to release their spores. So they kind of synchronize all of their spores and shoot them off at the same time and create this big cloud. Here's another video. I think it's a little easier to see in this one. There it goes. Yay. So if you are lucky enough to find one of these, uh, super fun to just give them a little gush of wind, see if you can get them to release their spores. Oh, another really interesting thing I learned about this mushroom, um, they have a really fascinating life cycle. So we find them as saprotrophs on dead wood that's already on the ground. Like I said, they usually grow um, singly or kind of along um, sticks that are partially buried, but uh, their life cycle starts off as a plant pathogen up in the branches of trees. So they have an asexual stage that can be found on branches of oak trees in particular, but also other um, broadleaf trees. And so they're actually um, attacking the branches and limbs of those trees and slowly kind of um, eating away at them and producing asexual spores. Um, Canidia, yeah, they have a, a Canidia stage and it's known as um, Conoplia globosa because a long time ago, we didn't realize that these asexual spores were from the same organism that also produces a sexual fruiting structure like a mushroom. And so the scientists gave different names to both of them. And now we've been able to figure out, oh, these two things that are very different are from the same organism. So I just thought that was really interesting. 
Ah, and lastly, this is also technically an edible species. <laughs> Michael Quo said something really funny about this one um, in uh, his book on edible mushrooms. He calls it mediocre. The <laughs> edibility is mediocre. And he says, the devil's urn is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's not good, mind you, but it would be possible to eat it with a forced smile if your Aunt Wanda served it to you. <laughs> uh, so this one was also featured on Alden Dirks' website. Um, he actually enjoyed eating this mushroom and he called himself a devil's devotee. Um, so if you feel bold this spring, you could try a devil's urn. No guarantees about how it will affect you, um, but you might like it. Who knows? <laughs> All right. On to the next one, species number three. This is another early spring species. This is a rust fungus that you can find growing on one of our many spring ephemeral wildflowers. Um, so anyone who spends some time in the woods in the spring uh, probably has seen spring beauties before, but you may not have noticed little tiny yellow specks growing on them that are evidence of the spring beauty rust fungus. Um, so you can find these orangish yellow rings or spots on all of the different parts of spring beauty plants. Um, and it can also cause a reddish discoloration of the plant tissues as well. So this is, even though it forms a circular shaped um, structure, which gives the impression of being a, an ascomycete, this is actually a basidiomycete. So kind of interesting um, how it gives the illusion of being an asco to some degree. Um, yeah, so you can find this rust fungus on all of the different spring beauty species that grow around here. Uh, there's at least two different species that grow in Western Pennsylvania, the Carolina spring beauty and the Virginia spring beauty. Um, they have identical flowers, but the Virginia spring beauty has really narrow grass-like leaves. So in this picture, this is the Carolina spring beauty, Claytonia caroliniana. But yeah, this is Puccinia marii wilsonii. Um, really fascinating rust fungus. I love looking for this in patches of wildflowers. Um, yeah, uh, so you can find it um, all throughout Eastern North America where you can find spring beauties growing. And you can find it from late March through mid-May, which is when spring beauties are up above the ground. Um, I've already seen spring beauty leaves out in some spots in southwestern Pennsylvania, so now is about the time to start looking for this rust fungus. A lot of rusts have really complex life cycles. This one, not so much. It only hangs out on spring beauties, at least so far that's how it seems. So yeah, this is the, the fruiting time of this one. Lines up pretty well with when spring beauties are out. Um, here's another shot of Claytonia virginia or Caroliniana, the Carolina spring beauty. Um, so you can see those broad shaped leaves and these kind of specks along the leaves here. And here's a close up of those structures. I don't know exactly how to pronounce this word. I think it's Aceum. It's spelled A E C I U M. But that's what you call this structure here. It's a specialized structure that's really only found in um, rust fungi. And there's a special type of spore that's produced in there that's different than um, spores you find in other fruiting structures. ACO spores is what they're called. Okay, move it along here. Also, I am not keeping an eye on the chat. I am so sorry. <laughs> uh, do I know how many 
wildflower rusts we have? Oh my gosh, so many. Um, I've found rusts, oh geez. Yeah. <laughs> um, I found it on, there's one on Harbinger of Spring that I really wanna try to find this year. I haven't found that one yet. Um, there's one on Jack in the Pulpit. Um, yeah, and those are just some of the ones that come to mind. I'll be presenting on an additional rust fungus later in this presentation. <laughs> yeah. Any other uh, questions that I miss? I hope not. Oh yeah, great question. Do they hurt the plants? So that's something I meant to mention. Um, there's no evidence that this rust fungus is causing any harm to spring beauty populations. I know a lot of times when people learn about plant pathogens, it's an invasive species where it's like, chestnut blight or Dutch elm disease, um, where it's like a really big concern for the plant species. Um, but in this case, spring beauties and spring beauty rust have evolved together and exist in uh, a natural harmony. So the rust affects a small percentage of the plants. Um, I don't know much about, you know, maybe it affects ones that are struggling or, you know, who, who knows why it only affects some of the plants, but it never seems to be capable of affecting all of the plants in a population. Um, I don't know if there have been any long-term studies about uh, if it's able to kill the plant or if it just kind of weakens it for that growing season. And then the next year, uh, that plant is fine. Spring beauties are perennial plants. So they sprout from a tuber. Um, so they have energy reserves in that tuber. So, you know, if they only succumb to the disease for maybe a season, they might be okay. Um, but if they repeatedly get the disease, then they might perish would be my hypothesis. Hope that answers that question. All right, next up, we've got the dryad saddle. Cereoporus squamosus. This is a pretty popular mushroom. A lot of people know it. Um, yeah, so it's got this kind of tan cream color uh, with brownish scales. It's shelf-like with um, a stem. Sometimes the stem is pretty short. Sometimes it can be pretty long and it often becomes black at the base. It's got white to cream colored pores. So this is our first polypore mushroom that I'm presenting on. And uh, I've got a picture to show you the pores here in a little bit. This is a saprotroph, so it decomposes uh, dead woody material. Um, it's also sometimes found growing on living trees, so it can be a moderate parasite. Uh, every time I've found this, it's been growing on either an elm tree or some kind of maple, uh, usually a box elder or a silver maple. Um, so that's what I usually find it on. I'm sure you can find this growing on other broadleaf trees though, because fungi are beautifully complex like that. Um, yeah. So this is where you can find dryad saddle. It's much more common east of the Rockies, but apparently you can find it in the West sometimes. And, uh, yeah, fruiting time for this one, it really picks up in May. Um, so kind of mid-April into May, that's really the time you wanna be out looking for this species. If you're thinking about um, harvesting this for the table, this is also an edible species. Um, generally, you wanna pick younger, fresher specimens. So getting out early is probably a good idea. Um, I've tried this mushroom twice. And the first time I thought it was delicious. Uh, the other time, in my opinion, it was inedible. <laughs> I don't know what the difference was, but um, yeah, I've had mixed results with it. I think the key to preparing this is to cook it uncovered to evaporate off 
uh, any water. I feel like it can really hold on to a lot of water. Um, and then once you cook off the water, um, you can add some oil to the pan and get it nice and crispy. I think that's the best way to prepare it, but maybe other folks have some experience, have a really good recipe. Um, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, so yeah, here's a, a great shot of the pores. This is a young one, right? So you can see the stem kind of developing down here. And this is all the fertile surface where the pores are starting to develop. You can even see some of the scales on the cap here. So yeah, this is pretty much, if you see a large polypore with large pores in the spring, that's kind of pale, cream colored, it's this. Um, there's other polypores that grow in the spring, but none get really as large as this. Um, yeah. One more shot. Fluff posted this beautiful picture. This, you can really see some of the blackening color on the base of the stem here. And it really gets pronounced as the mushroom ages, I feel like. The older they are, the more black the stem tends to be. All right, so you all had some questions about rusts earlier. Uh, luckily for you, I included another rust fungus in this presentation. Here we have mayapple rust, a lotus podophyli, podophyli, Latin. Um, so yeah, this one is really closely related to spring beauty rust. They're both in the Puxiniaceae. Um, and you can see that they look pretty similar. This actually used to be in Puxinia until um, DNA evidence restored it to the genus Alotus in 2012. So how do you identify this one? Well, for most of these rust fungi, identifying the, um, the host plant is really key. So here's a picture of mayapples. This is a really common um, spring wildflower that you can find in our forests around here, particularly in broadleaf forests um, with deciduous trees. I, you know, it's really hard to go somewhere in the woods in May and not see May apples, I think. Um, they're just everywhere. They look like little umbrellas out of like a Dr. Seuss novel, um, right? They're just so cute and they'll get a white flower on them when they're mature. So the really old ones uh, that have stored enough energy in their root systems will produce two leaves with a flower dangling down between them. So that's what the mayapple looks like. And sometimes you'll notice mayapples that have some slightly discolored leaves or the leaves will be kind of curled or wilty. And if you turn them over, you'll find this bright orange, um, beautiful rust fungus decorating the underside of that leaf. Um, so yeah, these structures are made up of tens to hundreds of these little um, cup-like structures. And uh, yeah, so this species is a biotroph. Um, you can only find it on living mayapple. And um, yeah, because of that, it's limited to the mayapple's range. So you only find it across uh, Eastern North America, east of the Rockies. And um, mayapples, they're not a true spring ephemeral because you can still find um, mayapple leaves up through the summer. Um, all of the true spring ephemerals like spring beauties and harbinger of spring and trillium, well, some trilliums, <laughs> uh, their leaves totally die back um, by June and uh, they're totally dormant the rest of the year. So that's a true spring ephemeral. The mayapple, you can find it into the summer and still find the rust growing on it even as late as July. Cool, just checking on the chat here. <laughs> Someone yell at me if there's a question here <laughs> that I need to answer. All right, next up we've got the wine cap, Strafaria rugoso annulata. So this is a really beautiful mushroom. Fluff took this amazing picture of wine caps 
And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to share a little bit about them. This is probably my one of my top edible species. Um, so this is definitely one worth learning. I feel like it has a wonderful texture. It's very crunchy. A lot of people um, get kind of turned off by the squishiness or sliminess of mushrooms when they're cooked. I feel like this one is really nice and crunchy. Um, so if you don't like the texture of other mushrooms, you might like this one. Well, how do you identify this mushroom so that you can bring it home and cook it? Well, it's got this beautiful wine red cap and you'll notice the gills are attached and they're um, kind of this gray color. And as they age, they turn more of a purplish gray color. Um, so the spores of this are kind of purple brown to purple gray or purple black. And um, yeah, another really key identifying feature you can see here is this annulus. And it has this kind of cogwheel pattern to it. So that's another really key feature to look for, that cogwheel annulus. Um, the habitat is also really helpful in identifying this. Uh, this mushroom is a saprotroph um, and a biotroph. So I'll get into that more in a little bit, but it's typically found in wood chips um, or other disturbed habitats where there's a bunch of woody debris accumulated in one spot. Um, along streams, like where floods have happened and lots of sticks and other woody debris have accumulated, that's another good place to look for this species. Um, it's also really easy to cultivate. So what else can I share about it? Well, you can find it throughout Eastern North America. That's where it's native to. Um, I'm not sure if it natively grew on, on the West Coast or if it's just kind of spread due to cultivation, but you can find it uh, in the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, yeah. And fruiting time for this one, late April is when I really start to see a lot of this. Um, and it'll fruit repeatedly through May. Anytime we get a nice good uh, soaking, go out a couple days later and check your wine cap spots. You might see a couple more fresh mushrooms popping up. Uh, I grow this species in my garden. And I definitely get bigger fruitings in the spring, but I also get fruitings in the fall sometimes as well. So here's a picture from my garden of a wine cap harvest from a couple years ago. Um, so this is a species you can buy um, inoculum for it online. A lot of different places sell um, like a sawdust spawn of this. And you just need some fresh wood chips, lay down like a solid, three to four inches, sprinkle your sawdust, cover it with another inch or two of wood chips, water it really well. And if it's in a shaded area, you'll get wine cap mushrooms year after year. Um, so it's a really great way to just kind of passively cultivate some mushrooms if you've got some outdoor space, like a garden. Um, yeah, this is a really great way to regularly encounter this species. I, I don't think I've ever actually encountered it in the wild now that I think about it. Um, it does have a lookalike, sort of. Um, sometimes this mushroom, when it's sun bleached, takes on more of a brown coloration. And so it can look like a lot of other brown mushrooms that grow on wood chips. Probably the most common brown mushroom that grows on wood chips in the spring is um, Agrosibi praecox, the spring field cap, which is a, a species cluster. There's a bunch of different species going under that name. Um, yeah, so that would be a species to compare against. The wine cap always has uh, more of a black spore print. Agrosibes will have a brown spore print. So that's one way to tell the difference. Agrosibe caps are usually pretty cack, uh, cracked. Uh, wine cap caps, <laughs> wine cap caps generally stay pretty smooth. Um, if you don't feel like buying spawn, if you find this in the wild, you can just cut off. You see all the little like rhizomorphs at the base of these. Um, so all of this white stuff, that's mycelium and rhizomorphs. You can just take that and transplant it into your garden. Or um, if you do cultivation work, you can sterilize a substrate, 
put these rhizomorphs on it and grow it out into some spawn and then spread it to your garden. Um, the most cool thing about this species though, and part of why I grow it in my garden, is that it doesn't only eat wood. Uh, so wood is a really carbon rich uh, resource, but it's pretty nutrient poor otherwise. So because of that, Strafaria rugoso annulata supplements its diet with nematodes. So this species produces little microscopic spine balls that are called um, acanthocytes. So <laughs> these acanthocytes are just little balls of spiky mycelium. Um, they're, they're, they're cells, um, spiked cells. And so they penetrate the nematodes and kill them and immobilize them. And that allows the mycelium of the fungus to wrap around them, digest them and get lots of nitrogen, phosphorus and other nutrients that they need from the nematodes. If you don't know what nematodes are, they're little, mostly microscopic. Sometimes they're big enough to see with your naked eye. Um, they can cause disease in plants. So gardeners sometimes are looking for ways to control nematodes. Um, so if you're a gardener or a farmer and you have nematode problems, installing a uh, wine cap patch might be your solution. Yeah, they're really effective at immobilizing these. There were a couple studies done where like they put nematodes in a Petri dish with some mycelium from wine caps and within 24 hours, they had killed like all of the nematodes in the Petri dish. It was like very effective. So fascinating. Um, and it just keeps getting more fascinating from here. Here we have uh, a species that doesn't officially have a common name, I, I dubbed it the millipede devourer for this presentation. The scientific name is Arthrophagia myriapodina. Um, this is a really cool fungus because it's from an entirely different phylum than most of the other fungi we see. Um, so I was talking about the zygomycota earlier. That's an old group that um, I think maybe five years ago or so, maybe a little longer ago, was split into two different groups. So now this is in the phylum Zoopagomycota. And uh, this is in the Entomo Entomophthorales. <laughs> um, so that's the insect destroyers. This is related to um, Massospora cicadina, which grows on cicadas. Maybe you've heard of the flying salt shaker of death. Um, so this is related to that. Um, there's also a fungus that grows on house flies that this is related to. Um, so these ones are not related to cordyceps or some of those other ent entomopathogenic fungi. This is a, a totally different group. Um, yeah, so how do you identify this? Well, you find a millipede that has crawled up to a place that seems unusual for a millipede to be hanging out. Um, I often find it on this species, which is um, Aphaloria virginiensis. So this is kind of a, a fairly large millipede. They're about three inches long sometimes, maybe a little longer. And uh, they're black with kind of yellow and orange patterning. And uh, you usually find them in the leaf litter or under logs. But when this fungus infects them, they crawl up to the highest point that they can reach. So you can sometimes find them clinging to the sides of trees or on top of fence posts, on top of rocks, logs, and they'll often be slightly curled and gripping onto their substrate. Um, and uh, once the millipede gets into that position, um, the fungus kills the host and uh, erupts from between the segments of their body and releases a bunch of spores. Um, yeah, so <laughs> this is a, a really fascinating um, fungus. Here's another picture of it. Um, I think I saw these ones in Cook Forest. But yeah, you can find this on other species of millipedes as well, but I've only ever found it on this species of millipede. Um, folks find it on the West Coast or in California. Um, folks find it throughout Eastern North America. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, it's not a super well-studied fungus, but I think Matt Kaysen is doing some research on it. So hopefully he'll elaborate on it at our next meeting. So I don't wanna to go too far in, in depth on this species. Um, it begins to appear here in late April. And the best time to look for this is after a significant rain event. Usually the fungus um, spreads during a heavy downpour, gets on the millipede and infects it. Um, and then usually about 24 hours later, uh, the fungus takes over the millipede, gets them to climb up and begins consuming it. And then it will release these spores. Um, so check out this picture. These are some of the canidia that are produced by this fungus. And these are asexual spores. So when we're looking at um, the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes, uh, most of those structures we're looking at are sexual reproductive structures. So this is an example of a, an asexual spore. And um, I, I've never noticed this, but I guess sometimes when you find this, you can find almost a halo of like white dust around the millipede, which is just all of the spores being scattered about. Oh yeah, this fungus was just named in 2017. So that's part of why it's not very well studied. <laughs> um, we've only had a name for it for about five years. <laughs> oh yeah, that's funny, Barbara. I love millipedes, they're fascinating. All right, moving along here. We've got the weeping widow. So we're getting later into spring now. Uh, things are really starting to heat up and the weeping widow makes themselves known. This is Lacrimaria lacrimabunda, but there's actually several species that go under this name. So this is definitely one to pay attention to, to, to think about thoroughly documenting um, and maybe collecting to, to look at under a microscope or submitting for DNA barcoding. Um, I think a couple different names I've heard are Lacrimaria velutina and Echinoseps. Um, so there's, this is a pretty variable species. Generally, it's got this golden um, orangish brown color to it. Um, this one, the lighting was uh, a little off. So this is kind of grayer than normal. Um, but yeah, it's got brown to black gills that are um, covered by a cortina when they're young. So here's another shot where you can see that that partial veil, this kind of cobwebby cortina underneath here. And the stem color and texture is um, kind of identical to the cap except for right underneath the gills. So there'll be kind of a smooth patch right underneath the gills. Um, and then it resumes this kind of fuzzy texture along the stem going down from there. You find this mushroom um, usually growing out of the ground. I usually find it just out in the grass somewhere, um, in lawns, pastures, meadows, along trails. Um, also sometimes in the forest, associated with dead wood. Um, there's several looks lookalikes for this species. Um, just off the top of my head, there's like Armillaria, Peniolis, Psilocybe, Statharella. They all look somewhat similar. Um, this mushroom has dark colored spores. Um, so it's got a black spore print. I'll show you a picture of that here in a sec. Uh, you can find it all over Eastern North America and along the West Coast. It's pretty common. Uh, again, probably multiple species here going under this name. So who knows, maybe the West Coast species is different or a lot to find out still. And fruiting time for this one. This is um, one that you can find almost equally in the spring and in the fall. Um, if you think about the types of conditions that are occurring in spring and fall, generally we have cooler nights, warmer days, a fair amount of rain. Um, so those conditions trigger the mushroom to fruit at both times of the year. Um, 
Yeah, so there's a lot of different species where you experience this, where you find them in the spring, and then you find them again in the fall. So here's a, a shot of those gills, and all of the black coloration along here is um, spores that have been deposited along the remnants of that partial veil. And here's another shot kind of showing the modeling color of the gills. There's a really big word to describe this feature, inaquahymeniferous, I think is how you say it, inaquahymeniferous. Uh, it just means that the spores mature at different rates. So anywhere it's darker, that's where the spores are beginning to mature. Um, so the gills start off kind of pale, and as the spores mature, it becomes black and creates this cool mottled pattern to the gills. All right. Next up here, we've got Psilocybe ovoideocystidiata. Um, this is one of our native um, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, so just going to say up front, this is a psilocybin containing species. And um, I'm sharing information on it for educational purposes only. I think it's a fascinating mushroom in terms of its ecology. Um, it has a, a, a unique ecology. And um, yeah, psilocybin is a um, controlled substance. So possessing this mushroom at the time is a felony. Um, so just know that. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about it and how to identify this species because I see it a lot in the spring. I think it's incredibly beautiful and interesting. And yeah, I wanted to include it. So how do you identify this mushroom? It has this beautiful chestnut brown cap. Um, and sometimes it can be a little more yellow or orange, but it's always very brownish. Um, it's hygrophanous or hygrophanous, depending on how you put the accent on that word. Um, so that means as the mushroom gets wet and dries, there'll be distinct patches of lighter and darker color in the cap. Um, it's also viscid when wet. So when this mushroom is wet, the cap is pretty sticky and slimy. It's translucent striate near the margin. So as it matures along the edge of this mushroom, you'll see lines where the gills are um, attaching underneath. And um, the cap is pretty like bell shaped, but it becomes kind of undulated in maturity. Um, so all the pictures I have are of younger specimens. As it matures, the cap really starts to um, undulate and take on some interesting texture. Uh, a really distinct feature of this is all of the parts of it bruise a um, blue-green color. And um, yeah, the ecology of it, it's found on woody debris. Um, I often find it on wood chips, but it can also be found along streams, um, just like, uh, what species was that? The wine cap, Strafaria, how I was talking when streams flood and a lot of sticks build up in the floodplain uh, and get buried. That's kind of the ideal habitat for this species. And it is native to our area. Um, so it's most common throughout the Ohio River Valley. So here's a map from INAT showing observations of this species. Um, you know, obviously you're gonna see more observations of it around where people live, just because there's more people out looking um, and taking pictures of stuff. So you can probably find it throughout all of Pennsylvania, um, which is pretty cool. And fruiting time for this species, it fruits much more abundantly in the spring. Uh, I begin finding it towards the end of April, uh, early May is usually when it first starts to fruit. And you can regularly find it following heavy rains until mid-June or so. Um, maybe even into late June if you live to the north. Um, yeah, it really likes areas that are disturbed by human activity. I always find it really close to water. Um, you can also find it anywhere where people pile up wood chips. So gardens is a great place to look for it. Um, yeah, 
but along streams or ponds or lakes, anywhere that semi-regularly gets flooded, um, that's really its preferred habitat. There's also evidence that this species is um, rapidly expanding its range, which I think is interesting. Um, this could be a good candidate species to study in terms of climate changes impacts on fungi, um, or maybe it's spreading just thanks to some help from humans. Um, I don't know if we, we have an exact answer on that. But yeah, you can see the uh, striate margin here and this blue bruising along the edge of the stem. <laughs> um, yeah, and here's a shot of the gills. So again, you can see the blue bruising here. And um, yeah, these beautiful wavy gills, they start out kind of this pale, um, brownish color. And then uh, this has purple brown spores. So that's another really important feature for this mushroom. Um, definitely take a spore print. There's a lot of different little brown mushrooms, many, many lookalikes for this species. Um, yeah, so a cool mushroom. All right. Oh, this is another one of my favorites. Mitrula, the swamp beacon or the bog beacon. Uh, we have at least two species that grow here. Um, possibly a third, but I don't think so based on habitat. So the two that we have here that I'm pretty sure occur in relatively equal abundance are Matrula elegans and Matrula unilatospora. Um, <laughs> Cheetos of the woods. Yeah, this is a really fascinating fungus. This is an ascomycete. Um, it doesn't produce a cup-shaped fruit body. Instead, it has this kind of cap with a distinct stem, um, which is kind of different from some other ascos. Um, yeah, the name Matrula, I think the root of that is mitre, um, which I think is an ancient Greek word for a headband or a turban. And it's also the name of the like golden cap that church, church dignitaries wear, like bishops, I think, wear a, a golden mitre cap. And so I think that's the origin of the name of this genus. Um, Unilato, Lunilato spora has kind of crescent moon shaped spores. So that's where that name comes from. Um, and this mushroom is very distinct, um, both in its physical appearance and in its ecology. Um, so identifying characteristics are this kind of pale white, um, relatively straight, but kind of crooked stem. Um, that's, it's very smooth and almost translucent. And uh, the cap is kind of this yellowish color. Sometimes it's a little more orange. Um, supposedly, Lunulatospora has more of a pinkish colored cap. It's like pinkish yellow. Um, but the best way to distinguish these two species is to look at their spores. The ecology of them is also fascinating. You only find this mushroom really growing in wet areas, usually um, in swamps, bogs, fens, areas like that, where there's kind of stagnant water, a bunch of like leaves piled up. Um, it really likes to grow on decaying plant matter in those environments, um, which is really interesting to think about because basidiomycetes, um, are uh, really good at decomposing wood, but the chemical reaction for that requires oxygen. So I guess ascomycetes are much better at surviving in anaerobic environments. Um, so usually in swamps and bogs and places like that, um, more than 75% of the fungal biomass is ascomycetes um, because they're just really good at digesting stuff in anaerobic environments. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. This is a pretty gelatinous mushroom. It's kind of sticky, slimy. Um, 
You can find it throughout Eastern North America. Um, this is a map of all of the Matrula genus observations in North America, I think. Um, so yeah, we have um, Matrula elegans here in Eastern North America. And we also have Lunulatospora. We also have one called um, Borealis, but it really grows more in kind of this boreal region um, across Canada. So I don't think we would have it really in our area. Um, maybe if you go up to the Adirondacks, you might be able to find Matrula Borealis. Um, but yeah, the best way to distinguish all three of those is by looking at the spores because they more or less look identical. Um, they fruit in the spring mostly, um, but if you go to more montane environments, um, you can find this later into the year, um, as late as September probably. Yeah. There's another picture close up of this. Um, sometimes these caps are really smooth uh, and almost look like a matchstick. That's another common name for this species. Um, most of the time when I find them, they're very irregular and um, just kind of have all these wrinkles and folds in them. Um, yeah, just kind of blob-like. I guess if we lived in the Southeast United States, it'd be easier for us to tell apart these two species because they slightly differ in their fruiting time. Uh, Lunulatospora is supposed to fruit before elegans, um, but once you get up to our latitude, they fruit at almost the same time. So that doesn't really help us. So you gotta put this under a microscope, look at their spores, and that should tell you which species it is. It has a few lookalikes. Um, there's some other ascomycetes like Microglossum or uh, Leotia lubrica that look kind of like this, um, but they have a very different ecology. You find them more in uh, woodland settings growing out of the soil. You really only find Matrula growing out of the leaf litter in a bog. I often find them in ditches too. Um, and you can find them under conifers or broadleaf trees. So sometimes around hemlock swamps is a good place to look. Um, I know some people have a lot of luck looking there. Um, I've had mixed results. I've found them in areas with hemlocks and I've found them in areas with no coniferous trees anywhere nearby. So maybe I saw both a different species and that's maybe they differ in their ecology a little. I don't know. All right, we've got a couple more species here. Oh my gosh. Um, so we've got Mycena acicula, the coral spring bonnet. Um, we're getting later into the spring now. This one you really start to find in late May. Um, this is one of the brightest mushrooms you'll find on the forest floor this early in the year. A lot of people would confuse this for a waxy cap mushroom. Um, which has similar colors, but has a much uh, more robust stem that isn't as long. Uh, and the stem of this species has some really fine um, kind of powdery coating to it, what's called pruina. Um, so yeah, this is a sapertroph on leaf litter and woody debris underneath broadleaf trees. And I usually find it not too far from water. You usually find it near streams or creeks. Um, doesn't mean you can't find it other places, but that's been helpful for me. Um, it's got this really deep red cap when it first starts fruiting and it transitions to orange and yellow as it ages and expands. The gills are pretty pale um, and they do attach to the stem, uh, but very narrowly in this case. Uh, but sometimes they can have a more adnate attachment where the gills are very obviously um, sticking to the stem. It's the type species for a whole section of the genus Mycena, which is interesting. Um, this is probably one of the easiest Mycenas to identify in our area if you're able to find it. It's so tiny, it grows on the forest floor, you really have to be looking closely to encounter it. 
Um, you can find it all throughout Eastern North America, um, along the West Coast, and it also grows in Europe. So this mushroom is a world traveler. Um, yeah, fruiting time, like I was saying, May, June, that's really when you find this. Um, you can find it later in the year. I have yet to find it in the fall, but apparently sometimes people find it in the fall. It's definitely much more common in May and June. And here's one last shot of it, just showing you what that looks like in the leaf litter. All right, I think this is my last one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so thank you for sticking with me through this. Um, this is the platterful mushroom, or rather the Eastern American platterful mushroom, Megacalibia broadmanii. Uh, this is just a beautiful, large, robust gilled mushroom that you find growing on decaying wood in late spring through um, the end of summer. But I, I really think it's most common in that late spring, early summer time period. That's when I really find a lot of this mushroom. So the cap is kind of a gray brown color and it's darker um, when it's young and it becomes paler in age. Sometimes it'll maintain some darkness in the center of the cap though, like in this one. Uh, the cap starts off with kind of these long fibers running along it. So you can kind of see these lines stretching from the center out towards the margin. Um, to use scientific words, radially streaked dark fibrils. Um, yeah. And sometimes it'll develop fissures in the cap that expose the flesh. So it's pretty common for there to be like lens shaped fissures and cracks. This one's got a very cracked cap. It's um, really showing off that feature of this mushroom. The gills are white and adnate. So they're attached to the stem and they're sub distant. They're not as close as you'd see on a lot of other mushrooms and it has a white spore print. Um, Typically you find this growing from buried wood or logs that are covered in moss like this one. Um, yeah. So you find this throughout Eastern North America. Um, previously, all Megacalibia in North America and Europe were called the same thing, Megacalibia platyphylla. And recent molecular studies have revealed five distinct species. So, Western North America has a distinct species. Eastern North America has a distinct one. Europe has a distinct one. And then there's possibly um, a highly endemic species in Texas and another one in um, Arkansas and Tennessee. So in our area, we only have one. We don't have to worry about uh, all the cryptic lookalikes, which makes it easy. Like I said, fruiting time for this one is late spring to early summer. That's really when you find a lot of this. And here's another shot of it um, showing off those gills. You can see the spacing on them. It's kind of somewhat close, but sub-distant. Sometimes they're more distant than in this picture as well. Uh, this species has some lookalikes, right? Um, there's other brownish grayish mushrooms with white gills that you can find. Um, growing in the forest this time of year, um, things like uh, Udomanciella, but that has a really thin stem. It's decorated with hairs and it grows much taller and has a wrinkly cap. Um, Ammonita farinosa can look kind of similar, but it grows mycorrhizally and it has free gills. Um, and the cap margin is striate. So that's some features to look for. This is another edible species. I think this is one of Gary Linkoff's favorite spring edibles. Um, I remember hearing about him enjoying this species. I know other folks in the club really enjoy collecting and eating this species because you can find so much of it. Um, I've never tried it, so I can't comment on its flavor, but yeah. Oh, well, thank you all so much for joining me on this exploration of spring fungi. Um, here's some credits for the images I used in my slides. And yeah, at this point, 
Um, I'll stop sharing and if folks have any questions about spring fungi, I'll, I'll let folks um, unmute and ask questions. Give me a sec here. Stephen, I have a couple of updates. Yeah. Uh, one of them is that the April 25 walk at Peters Lake is sold out. Oh, okay. And then the other is that as of March 11, our membership is up to 505. So it's probably still growing. Wow. Yep. Awesome. Yay. Well, thank you all so much for... Um, Oh yeah, Pluteus. I meant to mention Pluteus can be confused for Megacalibia. Um, Pluteus has pink spores and free gills. Um, so when they're young, their gills can be white. Um, but as they mature, they really take on a, a pink coloration and they usually have a, a distinct odor reminiscent of um, like a radish, I think. Um, so that can help you distinguish Pluteus from Megacalibia. They're both technically edible, I believe. Did you mention Entoloma? No. <laughs> yeah, Entoloma would be one to watch out for. Entoloma looks a lot like Pluteus, um, right? Uh, pink gills can also be gray. So Megacalibia can be a tricky one. Um, but if it's growing from wood, it's larger, it's got those spaced white gills that are attached to the stem um, that should, should keep you away from some of the more troublesome ones. Entoloma and Ammonita are two toxic lookalikes. So definitely know those species before you think about harvesting Megacalibia. I think it was like the first mushroom I identified on my own after like a couple of times going out with other people. And I didn't die, so I was just picture matching then. So it's possible to not die just eating this mushroom. I like your standards, Garrett. I've eaten it every year since. Didn't kill me once. <laughs> I don't know. I'd be careful with this one. Yeah, tons of times. Yeah, the entolomas are the entolomas are definitely in the vicinity there. So. True, true. <laughs> yeah, but great presentation. I really liked it. So thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Job, great job. You are of course missing Jeremiah, Caroliniana. Yes, I uh, forgot to mention. Um, I I avoided all morels and their allies. So I avoided all of the gyromitra because Kara is going to give a presentation on morels at Mushroom Education Day. So um, hopefully we'll make that presentation available for folks looking to learn more about morels. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Did we record your presentation last year, Kara? Um, I didn't give, I, I just had, a, I did a YouTube video last year on my own. So, I mean, if anyone wants to go, I could put the link in there and you guys could all watch my YouTube link. That's mainly just uh, for, you know, our local area, which is very helpful because it's, uh, if you're going to try and find something like a morel, you want to know how to find the ones in your area and uh, the little niches that they have in your area. So, yeah, I'll put I'll put it in the uh, the chat if people are interested. I you know I was bored. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'd love to see it. Yeah. Very cool video for sure. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, I'll stop the live stream.